Good morning, church. Today we'll be starting our services with song number three. Song number three. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah from the heavens, praise his name. Praise Jehovah in the highest all his angels praise proclaim all his hosts together praise him sun and moon and stars on high praise him O ye and of heavens and ye floods above the sky let them praise this gift Jehovah for his name alone is high, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. Let them praise his gift, Jehovah. They were made at his command. Then forever he established his decree shall ever stand. From the earth, oh, praise Jehovah. All ye floods, ye dragons, all fire and hail and snow and vapors, stormy winds that hear him call. Let them praise his gift, Jehovah. 
ever, for his name alone is high, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted. Far above the earth and sky, all ye fruitful trees and cedars, all ye hills and mountains high, creeping things and beasts and cattle, birds that in the heavens fly, kings of earth and all ye Princes, greater judges all. Praise his name, young men and maidens, aged men and children small. Let them praise his give Jehovah, for his name alone is high and his glory is exalted and his glory is exalted and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky song before our, op our opening prayer will be 250 How I love the great Redeemer, who is doing so much for me. With what joy I tell the story of the love that makes men free. Till my early life is ended, I will sing songs above. And beside the crystal sea, more and more my soul shall be praising Jesus and his love. He is everything to me, to me. He is everything to me, and everything shall always be. I will never cease to raise. A song of gladness in his praise. Here and in the world above, my soul shall sing to you a saving love. Life in light and joy is he, the precious friend who died for me. He has purchased my redemption, from my burden of sin away. And is walking on beside me, growing dearer day by day. That is why I sing his praises, that is why joy is mine. That is why forevermore on the everlasting shore I shall sing of the divine. He is everything to me, to me. He is everything to me, and everything shall always be. I will never cease to raise. A song of gladness in his praise. Here and in the world above, my soul shall sing a saving love. Life in light and joy is he, the precious friend who died for me. Glory be to him forever, endless praises to Christ the Lamb. He has filled my life with sunshine, he has made me what I am. 
Oh, that everyone would know him. Oh, that all would adore of the mighty friend above and his forevermore. He is everything to me, to me. He is everything to me and everything shall always be. I will never cease to raise a song of gladness in his praise. Here and in the world above, my soul shall see a saving love. Life and light and joy is he, the precious friend who died for me. Dave. Good morning, church. Uh, just want to pray that we have a good session today. Um, hope that we all can, uh, I don't know, I'm lost. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you for all being here, okay? Let's put it that way. And the ones that ain't here, well, you know, hey, they have their own little reasons, but I know that God is with them, and um, we will um, always be with him. And so you just uh, hope that we have a good uh, session today, you know, and uh, that each and every one of us pick something out of this uh, little session that will carry out through all our lives and stuff and just to help other people and do the things that we need to do. So, well, with all that said and be done, give it back to nobody. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Dave. Uh, if you're following along in your books, our next song will be 401. Though dark and dreary be life's way and burdens hard to bear, there's one whose love will never fill my heart, shall ne'er despair. My hope is stayed in him today, and he will safely lead. To that sweet home beyond the sea, Christ's love is all I need. Christ's love is all I need each day. I know, I know, Christ's precious love is all I need. He'll lead me safely on life's way. I know, I know, Christ's precious, precious love is all I need. Though trials press on every side and many snares there be, I look in simple faith to him who calm the stormy sea. He is a shepherd kind and true, his sheep he'll ever feed. This cheers me on and makes me strong. Christ's love is all I need. Christ's love is all I need each day. I know, I know, Christ's precious love is all I need. He'll lead me safely on life's way. I know, I know, Christ's precious, precious love is all I need. And when I hear the boatman's call, come cross the chilly tide, I shall not fear to launch my bark, for Christ is at my side. He bore the sting of death for me, has met my every need. And so I sing the sweet refrain, Christ's love is all I need. 
Christ's love is all I need each day. I know, I know, Christ's precious love is all I need. He'll lead me safely on my way. I know, I know, Christ's precious, precious love is all I need. The song before communion will be When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, 315. When I survey the wondrous cross, on which a prince of glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that try me most, I sacrifice him to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, love room. Love go down. Did there such love and sorrow me? Oh, thorns compose so rich a crown. Where the whole realm of nature mine that were present far too small love so amazing so divine demands my soul my life my all good morning everyone Welcome to the Lord's table. Did everyone get a chance to partake or get a, a cup? Maybe someone walking around to, to mute you on at this time. <clears throat> I'd like to open up your Bibles. I'm going to start my reading. I'm going to start in Matthew chapter 27. I want to apologize right off the get-go. As soon as I got left the house, got a few miles down the road, I realized I forgot my glasses. So it was a little too late to turn back around, so do my best. Matthew chapter 27, I'm going to start in verse 27 through 37. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole Roman cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And after weaving a crown of thorns, they put in his right hand and they kneeled down before him and mocked him saying, Hail, king of the Jews. And they spat on him and took the reed and began to beat him on the head. And after they had mocked him, they took his robe off and put his garments on on him and led him away to crucify him. 
And as they were coming out, they found a man of Cyrene named Simon, whom they pressed into service to bear his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they gave him wine to drink mingled with gall, and after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots. And sitting down, they began to watch over him, him there. And they put on him, on his head, the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. This morning, I'm not going to try to be too gory or graphic for the little ears that might be here this morning. But I need to, but I think we need to better understand crucifixion and the sorrow and anguish Jesus went through for us upon the cross. Some of you may have seen the passion of the Christ. <clears throat> some of it is not biblical, but gives us some understanding of what crucifixion was like. Most of our ideas about the scene of the crucifixion has been formed from artwork. The artwork excludes some of the atrocities and represents other details. Crucifixion was what was the most horrible manner of death known to mankind. It was utterly despised by the Jews. In Galatians 3.13, it says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. It has been used by a variety of different nations. Alexander the Great, upon defeating the city of Tyre, had 2,000 of its people crucified. A Jewish ruler, a ruler between the Greek and Roman rule, Alexander, I think it's Genius, had 800 Pharisees crucified. It seems the, uh, the process has been perfected by the Romans. It began with scourging, whip with three leather straps with a piece of bone or metal. The person was stripped of their clothing, placed on a large slanted pole so their skin would be stretched tight. They would then be whipped from their neck to their feet. The skin and muscles would be ripped apart and at times the spinal column would be exposed. Many went into shock and died at the stage. The person would bear the cross or a portion of it to the site of execution where they'd be stripped of their clothes and, and tied or nailed to the cross. And of course, Jesus was nailed to the cross. Jesus, or the, the nails in his hands would have been nailed through his wrists. In Greek, lang in, in Greek language, the word, the word hand includes the wrist area. The severed nerves resulted in excruciating pain. The word excruciating is derived from crucifixion. In 1968, archaeologists discovered the remains of some Jews who had been crucified upon the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. One of them had a spike driven through his heel. It seems that his two feet had been separated one side, one to each side of the cross, and nailed separately through the, the heel. The spike was used, uh, the spike used was made of iron seven inches long. It was similar to the, a railroad spike. When the person was raised upon the cross, the weight of the body would be would immediately cause the shoulders to, to pop out of joint. The victim's feet were a short distance off the ground, a few inches up to approximately three feet. The bodies of most victims were allowed to rot on the cross. <clears throat> Therefore, dogs or other animals would stay around the crucifixion sites and eat the bodies. At times, they would start eating the victims that were that before they died. A number of doctors had studied the process of crucifixion and determined two primary causes of death. Um, hyperbolic shock, low, low blood volume. As the body loses blood and other fluids, the kidneys shut down, causing insatiable thirst. Under, under continued stress, the heart became erratic. Um, exhaustion, uh, asphyxia, suffocation. The person could not breathe in the position they hung in. To breathe, the victim had to pull up with his arms and push with his feet. In Mark 15, 25, it talks about the, the hours of the crucifixion. And it says the crucifixion started the third hour. In Matthew 7, 46, Jesus cried out with a loud voice on the ninth hour. So six hours Jesus suffered on the cross. 
Crucifixion was the most horrible and shameful method of death known to man. And Hebrews 12, 2 says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. Out of the ugliness and agony of a crucifixion, God accomplished the greatest good for all, the redemption for sinners. In 1 Peter <clears throat> chapter 1, 18-23, it says, Knowing that you are not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from the futile way of this life, inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he has foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of, for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have obedience in the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring word of God. As we partake of the Lord's Supper this morning and every first day of the week, let's reflect, reflect upon the suffering Jesus went through on our behalf so we can have forgiven, so we have forgiveness of sin because he loved us more than we can ever understand. At this time, I'd like to uh, take this time that we'd already kind of mentioned that sometimes our minds wander and we're thinking about other things we shouldn't be at this point in time, like the roast in the oven that was mentioned at Bible class. Or if you talk to my wife, everything's camp, 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 camp. Um, well, let's, let's bow our heads or do whatever you'd like to do. Uh, let's take the next few seconds to um, try to clear our minds and focus upon Jesus and the cross. Let's say a prayer for the bread. Dear God and Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the love of your son and the love that you, you had for each and every one of us, that you gave me your only begotten son so that he could come to this earth and become that perfect uh, sacrifice for each and every one of us, giving us that, that chance of home home with you and, and forgiveness of sins. Help us at this time to, to wipe away all things that are going on in our lives at this point in time. Help us to focus upon the love of Christ and what he did for us by suffering upon that cruel cross. We, as we partake of this bread, let's help, help us to remind us of Christ's body and help us to remember his love. In Christ we pray, amen. Say a prayer for the fruit of the vine. Dear God, we kept you enough, Father. Continue our thanks for the love of, of your son. And as he hung upon that cross, his side was pierced and blood flew from his side. And we know that because of this blood that washes away our sins. Be with us now as we partake of this cup. And as we might take in a matter pleasing and acceptable in my sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper. At this time, the congregation here has set aside the opportunity to give back to the Lord. There's a box up here in front. There's also a way to, um, to give online.
which I haven't figured out yet. But eventually, I will. Um, let's let's say a prayer for the contribution. Dear God, we come to you now, Father Lord. We are so deeply thankful for all the many blessings you bestow upon each and every one of us. This opportunity to be here today to worship you. The opportunity to be able to live in this country where we're free to to worship that we're able to obtain jobs and to obtain the money through those jobs. Then we pray the Lord as we give back to you this morning, that we'll give back to you cheerfully and that the monies that are collected this morning will be used to further your word. In Christ we pray. Amen. Song before a lesson will be five three seven. Here we are, but straying pilgrims. Here our path is often dim, but to cheer us on our journey, still we sing this wayside hymn. Yonder, over the rolling river, where the shining mansions rise, soon will be our homes forever and. The smile of the blessed giver gladdens all our longing eyes. Here our feet are often weary on the hills that throng our way. Here the tempest darkly gathers, but our hearts within us say, Yonder over the rolling river where the shining mansions rise, Soon will be our homes forever, and the smile of the blessed giver gladdens all our longing eyes. Here our souls are often fearful of the pilgrims lurking foe, but the Lord is our defender, and he tells us we may know. Yonder over the rolling river where the shining mansions rise, soon will be our homes forever, and the smile of the blessed giver gladdens all our longing God. Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody here today. I was sitting, uh, I was sitting behind uh, uh, Karen through Summers Row. Counted nine people on eight chairs back there. Uh, I thought, boy, it must be a packed day. But uh, I think some of those uh, young adults just like sitting that close together. Although I noticed they've kicked a few people out uh, since then. Uh, the guys that were collecting the cups, not all of them have returned to that row. So maybe nine was a little too much. But we are glad you're here. I met a few people this morning, never met before. I met Elizabeth back over there hiding behind the green haws. But uh, glad to have you and Emmanuel uh, sitting, sitting back there. And uh, I think Rudy uh, took off, but we've prayed for Rudy in the past. And he was uh, with us for Bible class and continue to keep him in your prayer. So we hope all of you stick around and give us a chance to get to know you a little bit better afterwards. Um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, this is not our, uh, we're not going to be in Corinthians today, but I do want to read this verse because I, I just love it and I think it leads into what we're going to talk about better than anything else. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, I'm, I'm reading from the English Standard Version for this. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. I've always loved that verse. Uh, I've loved that idea that I, that we are becoming new creations. And I don't think you can hear that verse or read that verse without thinking about butterflies, right? Uh, the old caterpillar turning into a butterfly. Uh, my guess is God gave us caterpillars and butterflies just to drive that point home. Uh, I'm going to play, I think it's about a minute long or so, uh, but I'm going to play what is a, a slightly disturbing video uh, 
mostly because my mind can't grasp what's hand, happening there. Uh, but let, let, let's just roll that footage. Killed the audio because the munching was just too much. That fascinates me for a lot of different reasons. And the biggest question that I have as a mere non-scientist layman, okay, and a long ways away from whatever grade we studied that kind of stuff in grammar school too. So uh, I'm sure somebody will correct me uh, later. But this is what fascinates me about that whole process. And I mean, I wish we had time to watch everything. You know, they, they cut out some parts that I thought were crucial. I don't know why I thought they were crucial, but you know, I cut out a few parts. But where did the caterpillar go? And where did the butterfly come from? Is that caterpillar just carrying the butterfly around inside of him for all that time? And and I realized now I got the first time I watched it, I got a little confused because I, you know, I forgot that the tail was up by the leaf and the head was down. So it, I think it made a little bit more sense like the 30th time I watched through it. And I did watch through it a lot. There was some other things that just kind of uh like when it first came out, did you notice how there was like this big chunk of caterpillar still there, you know? And there were like these little tiny wings. How in the world does it get all the, the junk in that little piece of caterpillar back out? And because the wings got bigger. I mean, it, it, fascinating. I love the mystery and I love the wonder. Uh, and, it, and it just, it, it amazes me that something could go from one creature to another creation. And then it reminds me that that's, that's what God wants of each and every one of us. And, and I, it's so counterintuitive. I mean, that's why we are fascinated by this, because that's not how most things work out. I mean, you know, Tony and Susan have 10 puppies, and those puppies become things that look like puppies, but bigger. Uh, we have small children. And, you know, especially if, if that small baby's name is Connor Sullivan, it looks the same 20 years later, just bigger. I mean, his face looked exactly like it does now when he came out of the womb. Well, or a week later when I saw him. Let's, let's make something perfectly clear. We don't, we don't get a lot of this. And I think, unfortunately, sometimes in our Christian life, we don't get a lot of this either. We just go from people who are kind of good grow up knowing God a little bit, and we just work on that. And we just become maybe a little bit better versions of what we were as children. And that, that's not what Paul's telling the Corinthians. He's talking about becoming something that is a new creation. It implies a transformation. Uh, again, not a scientist. Should have had Michael come up. He's the insect guy. you know. But the, that word metamorphosis, it changes from one thing to another. And, and I struggle with that. I struggle with that. Even as I watch the butterfly thing, I think that's what God's wanting to happen in my life. And yet I still feel very caterpillarish. That's a word. This is, this is not going to be a series of lessons on Corinthians or 2 Corinthians. It's going to be a series of lessons on Galatians. But I had to introduce it from somewhere. And I like that passage. Um, we're not, this is not going to be a study. For those of you who want to know everything about Galatians, there's lots of great studies and books. And if, if you want to do that, I'd, I'd be glad to be part of a, of a you know, weeknight Bible study on the book of Galatians. And we can kind of 
getting into that. This is going to be something a little bit simpler. Um, let's go to the next slide, if we would. And we're going to start at the end of Galatians. I know it's probably the wrong place to start. But I think it sums up what the book of Galatians is about. Very similar to the verse we already read. Listen to what Paul says. This is from the New Living Translation. That's why I put it up there. It doesn't matter whether we have been circumcised or not. What counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. What counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. Let's focus on the second half of that phrase. What counts? You can rephrase that particular part of the passage any way you want. What counts? What's important? Better yet, I, I always like that one. What scores? What gets recorded? What matters? It's a good phrase. It, it, it appears that there's some people in Galatia who are all about keeping score. I mean, as, as we get into the book of Galatians, and it'll take us a little while, but one of the things that we're going to find out is people were keeping stats. They were keeping information. And they had forgotten that what really counts is whether they became new creations. They had a scoring system. I'm a big baseball fan. If you're not a baseball fan, forgive me for the next 30 seconds or so. Uh, but in baseball, there's a lot of stats. Matter of fact, baseball refuses to change some things just because it'll change the whole history. It'll change the stats and it'll change the record books. Um, but I like baseball. There's a lot of stats, but you know what? There's only one stat that matters. Wins. Wins and losses. That's what counts. In school, there's a ton of scores. A lot of tests. Everything in, uh, under the sun used to determine success. Uh, class ranks, all of that. In your workplace, in your social clubs, even in churches, there are statistics. There are a way of keeping track of things, keeping score. And yet, in each and every one of those situations, there's always one thing that counts. Wins. Degrees. You know, the, those of you graduating from high school, don't listen to anybody. What counts is making it through the next phase. Nobody's ever come into my office and asked me, what was your rank? You know, where'd you graduate in, in, in rank? They might ask me where I graduated from, but they, they still don't storm out when they find out I went to some, you know, cheap fifth tier school. Um, there's always that one thing that matters. Sales. What about churches? What's the stat that matters? And listen to what Paul says. It doesn't matter whether. I've obviously whited out a part of that verse. It doesn't matter whether. Now, Paul's going to talk to the Galatians about circumcision because that's the, the stat they were keeping. That was the record that was going in the books for them. We're 2,000 years from that. I don't know the last time I sat in a serious discussion about whether people needed to be circumcised or not. I'll be honest, I've never sat and had a serious discussion about that. Circumcision is one of those words that I'm really only familiar with because it's taken the place of a lot of other things in my life. But we have our own stat books, don't we? I mean, we've got our knowledge-based stats. How many verses have you memorized? Can you answer certain questions in a class? We've got our skill stats. Are you a good teacher, good worker, clean liver? That's a, probably should have phrased that differently. Uh, I hope I have a clean liver. Only the doctor can tell you that. You know, have I lived a clean life? Ah, that's the word I was looking for. We have those cumulative stats. You know, well, how long have you been a Christian? What's your attendance like? I, I've left that blank because I, I don't know what to put in there. I know for me, it's, it's not whether I've been circumcised or not. That's not really the record I'm interested in. And yet, something needs to go in there. Because Paul's going to tell us what counts. Meaning, whatever we put in before what counts is the part that doesn't count. And we need to figure out what goes in that blank. And I haven't filled it in, 
because I don't know how. I don't know what goes in that blank for you. Don't get me wrong. I think I do better at telling you what you're focusing on too much than I do telling you what I'm focusing on too much. That's just who I am. I can see your faults a lot easier and I can see my faults. But I can't fill that in for you because I don't know what you value. I don't know what you think matters. I also can't fill in that blank for me because I struggle with letting go of what matters for me. So I don't want to fill it in. But I can answer this question. And I, and I think this is the question that we are going to dive into as we go through the book of Galatians. I can answer this. Am I a new creation? Am I a new creation? Am I different than I used to be? And, and despite where you're at in your walk with God, Yes, there's a point where you go from caterpillar to butterfly. There's a point where you go from the old self to the new self. There's a part that fits into 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, that we are a new creation, that we are born again. That, that is a great phrase. When you are born, you go from one kind of being to another. Should have brought this up last week when we were talking about Mother's Day or when we were talking about con. You know, I mean, let me refresh your memory. The moment before you're born, you breathe water somehow. I don't know how that works, but you are one kind of creature. And the moment you're born, you become a different kind of creature. And that doctor slaps you just so you'll take in a good breath of air and boom, you start living a different way. Food starts coming into your system a different way. Or you're, you, you went from a completely wholly dependent being to a completely independent being <laughs> I, I can't even say that with a straight face but for the most part you know you come independent as far as food intake and food outtake and all that other stuff you go from an alien and if you don't believe me have you ever looked at a sonogram of a child it's an alien inside there to a cute little baby when you are born again you go from one kind of creature to another. And I think the book of Galatians is going to tell us about the process of transforming. Because that is the question. Am I a new creation? Or am I just a little bit? I, I'm not. It's kind of like saying <laughs> that children, that babies are independent. I can't even say this with a straight face. Or am I just a better version of Tim? Because that's not a new creation. That's still me relying on the old self. Am I different than I used to be? The rest of Galatians is all about what process is best at transforming us, not improving us, transforming us. In fact, the book of Galatians deals with the only process that can actually transform us, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And next week, we'll get into that. Second half of chapter one, where we'll be next week, and we're going to start talking about that gospel. That gospel that can take us from the old creature to the new creation. This morning, what about you? What is your weather? Not the weather. But what are you going to put in there? It doesn't matter weather. And what's your stat? What's your skill? What's your success that God is trying to tell you? And don't get me wrong, these are good things. I'm not trying to paint these as bad things. These are good things. When you read through the book of Galatians, when you look at the Judaizers, they had good things going on. That's not what Paul's trying to say. What he's going to say is it doesn't matter whether, and you need to fill that in because then he's going to say what counts, what really matters, what counts is whether we're new creations or not. And that's what we're gonna be looking into. I'm not saying it's not good to you know, have stats. I'm not saying it's not good to be a better version of yourself, but I'm talking about what really matters and what counts is whether or not we are becoming new creations. So I look forward to, to sharing that with you. Last week, we were blessed to see a new creation pop out of the baptistry. I know I saw Sefer earlier. Uh, oh, there he is hiding from me. 
uh, you know, he was born again. Started out last Sunday as one kind of creature, became a new creature. But that process doesn't just end right there. We are constantly being renewed, metamorphosed, being changed by Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. If you're here this morning, maybe you're struggling with a part of that. You know, that caterpillar struggled. They don't just pop out of that cocoon. It's hard work. And sometimes it can get you down. Maybe you're in the process of being squeezed by God to become something different. And you want prayer. Maybe you're here this morning, and this morning's the morning that you've decided you want to be a new creation. You want to be born again. We'll help you with any of that. If you'll come forward while we stand and sing. Zion's call sweetly rings over land and sea, bidding us look to realms above. While the light from the throne shines for you and me, let us listen to the call of love. Zion's call is ringing, coming from the throne above. While we hear it ringing, let us heed the call of love. On the road to the goal, burdens we must bear, but we have help from realms above. We receive courage new when we kneel in prayer. Let us listen to the call of love. Zion's call is ringing, coming from the throne above. While we hear it ringing, let us heed the call of love. While we tarry below, there is work to do, and our strength cometh from above. As we labor and wait, we must all be true. Let us listen to the call of love. Zion's call is ringing, coming from the throne above. While we hear it ringing, let us see the call of love. In just a second, our brother John's going to lead us in a word of prayer. Uh, but before he does, a few announcements. There is a shower immediately following services for a wedding shower for Becky. And uh, everybody's, I don't know if everybody's, that's still kind of a gray area. Is everybody really welcome to stay? Like if I wanted to stay, would the women run me out? And I, I know sometimes the men, I don't know. I'm not staying. If you're a man and you want to stay and you want to test the theory, you might be welcome or you might not, but certainly uh, all the women are welcome to stay and uh, celebrate uh, Becky's uh, in, in pending nuptials. Is that the correct phrase? I get that right. It's been a bad morning for the English language so far for me. Uh, this evening at 530, is that correct? 530 uh, out at Bill and Rachel's house. If you don't know where Bill and Rachel live, talk to Bill and Rachel. Raise your hands or talk to you. If you, if you raise your hand, if you know where Bill and Rachel live. If you don't know, you can talk to any of those people. It's fairly easy to find, uh, but uh, the Brunsons invite you to come out and celebrate the graduations of Carter and uh, Colton. Uh, Carter's graduating from Golden West High School, and Colton just recently graduated from Harding University. So come on out. Also, a kind of a slash, send Colton on his way to the workplace, which will be in uh, southern Arkansas. So uh, come on out. On June 3rd, Where's Austin at? Oh, there he is. There he is. June 3rd, uh, the Stevens family invites you to their house uh, for an open house. There are details in the bulletin. I, I do realize I don't think the electronic version went out yet. I'll go do it as soon as I get done here while I'm avoiding the shower. Uh, 
And, uh, but they, they welcome you to come on out. Austin is graduating from Emmanuel High School. I'm contractually obligated to do that anytime I say that word, because uh, I went to a different school that, a uh, you know, little bit of, I don't know, rivalry there. Probably not, I don't know. They don't even remember. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, he is planning on uh, attending Reedley in the fall and uh, this summer, planning on working for some forestry service, I think, doing air, I, I don't know, keeping forest fires under control, because uh, only you can prevent them, Austin. So, but, uh, but come out June 3rd, and we're excited about that. Also, I don't think I saw him here this morning. Oh my goodness. I, the English language is the only thing hurting this morning. So is my memory. Marcus, thank you, Pat. Marcus is also great. Oh, there's Cheryl. I couldn't even see Cheryl. Since I, what? Graduating on the seventh. So keep Marcus in your prayers. Pressure Cheryl into throwing a party just so we can all continue our celebratory uh, June. But uh, we're excited about Marcus graduating as well. I believe he's graduating from Clovis High or Clovis East? Clovis East, number one. So, uh, but keep Marcus in your prayers as well. Um, there was probably something else. I, oh, you guys want me to say something? If you're interested, uh, a group of people will be camping next weekend, uh, Memorial Day weekend, and they're going to be at the uh, Shaver Lake Church of Christ, if I read that text right. If you're interested, raise your hands. Come talk to these two people. They'll give you all the details you need if you're interested in doing that. So I know there's a, a lot of folks that maybe are new to the congregation since last Memorial Day weekend. And then on Memorial Day, there's the barbecue up at YBC. Uh, it is a fundraiser. I don't think there's tickets you need to buy. Just come up, kick in a bunch of money. Uh, but the fundraiser will be at the camp. It's a barbecue. And I believe things get kicked off at 10 o'clock. So be up there about 10 o'clock and uh, look forward to seeing you up there. Anything else? Ladies class every Tuesday. All right, sounds good. Let's go to God in prayer. John's going to lead that. Let's go to God. Father, we just want to thank you for uh, bringing us all together this morning. We are thankful that we had this opportunity uh, just to be together as a family, to worship, to sing, to pray, um, just to just to be together, Father. We um, we are thankful that you love us. We're thankful that you have adopted us and transformed us. And we ask that you would just help us um, find opportunities in our life to just show what a life in Christ looks like. And if we're not there, Father, we ask you would help us just to get there, to, to get there, to live a life in you of joy and hope and faith. And we just ask that you would help us um, just to be examples of Jesus um, in our communities and our workplaces. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.